Welcome back to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. My name is Richard Lawrence, and I'm here today with our panel. We are back from a week-long hiatus. Mm -hmm. We've got Anna Jane Peril, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March. Welcome, everybody. Fully fleshed out panel. It feels like it's been a long time since we've all been in the same room. Together again. You guys look beautiful. Well, thank you. So do you. But most importantly, Dan's beard looks beautiful. (laughs) Beard Watch 2018 continues. I'm reporting live from the scene, and he looks fantastic. (laughs) And now we're in No Shave November. Oh, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So are there any plans at all to dispense with the beard once November is finished or maybe later? Probably. The, uh, no, in the, when it gets warm again. I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, it looks great. You got to yeah. give it a full it's, it's life It's mostly cycle. for insulation. <laughs> yeah. Here in Atlanta, you know, it depends on the season whether we actually need that or not. But it's yeah. seeming like it might be a little bit of a cold winter. Yeah, yeah I think so. Speaking of winter, of course, now we are past Halloween. I just took my Halloween decorations down yesterday. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, it's been a little while. Well, we had the lights up front that were not specifically Halloween, but they were close enough. So okay. the orange kind of gave it away a little bit. But anyway, we are now fully halfway into November. The holidays are approaching very, very mm-hmm. quickly. I am uh, going to have in-laws here in uh, Atlanta, which is going to be awesome. Um, and it also means the beginning of the holiday shopping season is upon us. Temptations are everywhere. They Mm -hmm. are coming at us fast Mm -hmm. and quick from, you know, every direction online, it seems like. Yeah, Mary and I were just talking about, right before we started filming, we are just talking about uh, hair curling irons. Like, I just want to buy a new one. Yeah. It's a season for buying. Yes, it is. It is. And And it seems like Black Friday has been around with us for a couple weeks now, at least. I keep getting emails about Black Friday, and I thought that was only Mm -hmm. one date right after Thanksgiving, but I suppose it isn't anymore. They're trying. I've heard reports, though, that this uh, holiday shopping season is not going to be what it was in the past. Really? Yes. Why is that? I think a mixture of things. I think people are just used to buying online. We don't have these special occasions that we go to the malls for, for anymore. So, Yeah, Amazon um, was kind of punished by investors uh, by, because it anticipated that the holiday season will be a little bit soft. Mm, in terms baked of- into the stock price, a softer holiday. Well, they did not have a very soft holiday at all in China. The biggest retailer there, Alibaba, for Singles Day, recently had quite a nice haul. Yeah, they um, <clears throat> there's a, a, a holiday called, or at least it's a marketing holiday called Singles Day, mm-hmm. where uh, single people are supposed to console themselves by, by shopping online. If only I'd known. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was huge. It was in the tens of billions uh, mm-hmm. in, in a single day. And uh, Alibaba is actually bigger than Amazon. It's the um, biggest online retailer in the world. Yeah, I've heard a couple people use it, but I you don't use it, right? No, no I I've don't. I've never used it. I want to now. After yeah. Dan told me that story, I was looking, and there's cheap beauty products. Oh, I can really? Get fake eyelashes for two dollars. Ooh. Mm-hmm. So the the real question is, do they also have an English language website? Yeah, it was so in English. I went on it, so Google or somebody worked that out for me. Google knows. <laughs> <laughs> well. For most of us, for the rest of us who, you know, might not be as adventurous to go to Alibaba's website, we do have our favorite online retailer, and that's Amazon, of course, which I will be shopping through. And yeah, oh, I love Amazon, and I used to be like the biggest like a hater of it, just because the interface really frustrates See, I don't me. Get that. As an online shopper, I just the interface. There's like eight different types of fonts. There's a bazillion links. I don't know where the photos are coming from. It was just very confusing. But honestly, I've, I've really gotten sucked in lately. As of the last like six months, I buy if if I need anything, I just check if it's on Amazon. Now mm. I don't even I don't even check anywhere else. I literally buy everything from Amazon, and really? I think we were saying in a previous feedcast that you could even if you were so inclined buy yourself one of those containers and make it a home. Like they sell it as a, like a home. Oh, like a buy. shipping container? Like a shipping container. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. I don't, you, really, I don't really shop on Amazon. Yeah, you don't I don't even have all. Amazon Prime. I'm one of those weirdos. That's insane to me. You're missing so many good TV shows, if nothing else. Well, our producer, Pavel, was telling me that he has Prime, but he doesn't buy anything from there. It took me a second to actually understand what he meant by that. He just mm-hmm. watches the shows, mm-hmm. right? You, but even though you have the free two-day delivery, I guess, whatever. Yeah. Pavel, that, that's really weird. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Subjective value. Well, right? I suppose that's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, so of course, you know, it's not only Amazon season because that's where many of us are getting our <laughs> holiday gifts from. Not all of us. 
What's Zoo wrong Lily. with you? Zoolily.com. I like a deal, and I'm sorry, my Amazon grandma is not likes Zoolily. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Target girl. I get, I have my Target red card, so I get free shipping, and it's cheaper. It's cheaper a lot of times than Amazon. So, really? yes, I thumb my nose at Amazon. <laughs> That's surprising. I didn't know that. Well, many U.S. <laughs> cities have had their noses mm. thumbed at. Or Amazon has thumbed their noses at them. Let's say that. Because <laughs> Amazon just wrapped up a search for their location mm-hmm. of their vaunted HQ2. They were looking over 14 months across the U.S. and Canada among 240 cities uh, for and where they would site their new headquarters. One of, of which was based, Atlanta. One of us yep. uh, was, yeah. was Atlanta. Yeah. And uh, Atlanta did not get it. And we'll talk a little bit about maybe some of the... Uh, good effects of that in here in a moment, but some other sort of factoids about the 14 month search. Uh, They were looking for a location for, of course, their second headquarters because they're based out of Mm -hmm. Seattle and they were identifying a location where they could site 50,000 high tech workers. So these are hundred, hundred thousand plus jobs that they were going to put into a single location at first. However, what ended up happening is that they selected two locations. They selected Crystal City, which is a neighborhood of Arlington, Virginia, which is mm-hmm. literally right across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C., a very crowded place traffic-wise, which will be interesting to see how they mm-hmm. tackle that. And they also selected <laughs> uh, Long Island City, which is uh, close by to Queens. It's you know part of New York metropolitan area. And they are now going to split their 50,000 new workforce that they're citing there between those two cities. So about 25,000 in each place. And all of this was done behind the scenes, similar to all the other bids, uh, including Atlanta's. And they've just begun to now release the details of what these various municipalities Mm -hmm. and states were actually promising to Amazon were they to locate in their respective places. Yeah. The number I found was um, an incentive package of a total of three point four billion between both New York and Virginia. So, what do you mean by incentive package? Um, <clears throat> there were performance based direct in, direct incentives in New York of one point five billion, um, of two hundred ninety five million in Virginia. Um, excuse me, 573 million in Virginia for performance-based direct incentives. And that's just... So what are those? Do you mean like tax breaks or do you mean like, is that what that means? Tax credits, but also cash grants. So cash grants, Mm -hmm. meaning literally the city will just give them money. Mm -hmm. And also promises to beef up infrastructure in the case of uh, Crystal City to have a connector bridge built between the national airport and the city. And that's part of that figure. That's part of that 3.4 billion. Right. Okay. Interesting. But you said tax, tax cuts... Cash grants, what else are we looking at? I mean, in terms of, I feel like some of those are kind of different, right? If we're talking about the different benefits well, let's a municipality take a step back. might be able to give. Yeah, so let's take a step back real quick because I think this is an interesting sort of way to introduce what actually happened. So from Atlanta's mm-hmm. perspective, they just released the details of the incentive package today. It included everything from direct cash grants, from mm-hmm. uh, tax breaks, tax credits. Um, they were even going to put a special Amazon executive lounge together at the Atlanta airport. Ooh. They were going to have some sort of dedicated Amazon Marta car on the train that goes from the airport to the city. To oh nowhere else. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, pretty much to nowhere else. Yeah. And in fact, interesting uh, story was I read recently that uh, the Amazon advance team, when they were coming from the airport to the city, mm-hmm. ended up going on a Marta train that broke down on its way into the city. <laughs> oh, no. So uh, the truth comes out. Inauspicious. Yeah. Uh, uh, beginning to that examination. But all these, you know, it's interesting, you know, you get the big numbers, you get the billions of dollars and millions of dollars when it comes to these cash incentives. But then you also get these interesting little, you know, things like they were going to open up a a special training academy for Amazon employees Mm -hmm. here in Georgia. And on that, it actually said cost incalculable slash TBD. Oh. So the number was just that great. (laughs) We'll Uh, make it up later. We'll make it up later. We're (laughs) filling the actual details. But these are all, in many ways, different tools inside the local and state legislator mm-hmm. uh, toolbox for attracting companies to their states, right? I mean, this, this is not a new thing. Amazon just happens to be one of the biggest mm-hmm. entities that's ever looked at getting these mm-hmm. sorts of mm-hmm. incentives. They're mm-hmm. the bell of the ball. Yeah. Except for you. You're a zoo lily lady, so I don't, I'm not going to let you live that one down. <laughs> They're going to overthrow the Amazonians any day now. <laughs> the zoo lilians. Well, and so... 
there are a lot of different opinions on this, and we'll get into this in a little bit. There are people who believe, A, that these tax credits and incentives otherwise are uh, corporate welfare, right? So they believe that well-placed people are gaming the system, getting special treatment from legislators and politicians otherwise. And mm -hmm. then there are people who believe, you know, whenever there's a decrease in the tax burden that the government levies on a company or an individual, um, that that's, that's just and that's fine. And so I want to get into that a little bit uh, here in a minute. One of the uh, interesting pieces of information I want to launch that with uh, is my friend Michael Farron at the Mercatus Center, uh, based out of George Mason University, mm -hmm. and his colleague Ann Philpott. They wrote recently, Amazon HQ2 is the only competition where the losers are winners, where the losers are winners. And he's basically, mm -hmm. they're arguing that because of various things, you know, targeted subsidies don't actually create growth mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because they believe it's crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and they provide a lot of data that essentially says tax incentives are not the reason that companies select certain venues to mm -hmm. put their companies to open their offices. They basically do it for every other reason. Proximity to a highly skilled workforce, a yes. good public transit system, an mm -hmm. airport that can get you from coast to coast and, and elsewhere. Yeah, just as an example, uh, New Jersey offered to Amazon $5 billion with another $2 billion from Newark. And Maryland offered $8.5 billion, yet Amazon picked them both over to pick their neighbors. So it just goes to show that it's not all it, about... And that. that's like in tax, and that's in tax incentives and things like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's my opinion that I agree with, with the authors of the, uh, of the Mercatus piece that it's crony capitalism. But Dan, you and I were talking a little bit before the program, and you might have a little bit of a different perspective and we'll see if the fur flies here in a moment <laughs> yeah <flies. laughs> for me um it's not so much about uh equality as it is about justice so um uh, there's this great quote from murray rothbard he says equality of unjust treatment can never be upheld as an ideal of justice therefore he who maintains that a tax be imposed equally on all must first establish the justice of the tax itself and I think one way uh, of, of thinking about that is to think about other issues of, of justice. So, for example, uh, drug prohibition that, you know, a, a lot of libertarians, we think that drug prohibition is unjust. So let's compare. Let's say that there was this rich neighborhood where um, maybe the, um, the people are friendly with the, the local um, police and they never get busted for their drug use. And the uh, poor neighborhood does. And so <clears throat> along the lines of, of just like, well, everyone needs to be equal and nobody can, can have special privilege because of special relationships, then you, you might argue that, okay, well, th they, the, the rich people should be rated for, for drugs to, 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 to even it out. But really, it's, it's the, the fact that the, the poor neighborhood should be extended the, the benefits uh, of, of that. And a, a, in the best case scenario or in the... the but the worst case scenario would be to equal it out towards injustice. Well, and so I agree with you on, on the drug case for sure. Um, and in this case, I would say I actually agree as well because here's the thing. I, I, I agree with Murray Rothbard with what you said there, that just because a tax is spread equally or, or distributed equally among everyone doesn't make it any more just than it is if it were targeted or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, totally agree with that. However, I think one of the things that uh, and you can pipe I in the I don't know if I agree Here, with that. Here's the thing. Um, what, from a policy standpoint, you know, let's, let's talk maybe a little bit different from, from justice, although I think it kind of hits on the same notes. Um, what Michael Farron and Ann Philpott said here is using the average subsidy that each of these states were promoting to Amazon, um, we estimate how much state each each state could reduce its corporate income tax over the life of the subsidy. So basically they're arguing, let's not target the benefit toward one single company, mm -hmm. right? So let's, in the same way, let's not target one neighborhood to enforce these drug laws, but let's actually, from a policy standpoint, make the corporate income tax lower across the board instead of just for this new entrant who wants to cite their office in your place. Mm -hmm. They said, based on the average subsidy that was offered to Amazon, each of these states could reduce their corporate income taxes by 29%. Most strikingly, 
uh, three states, Colorado, Maryland, and North Carolina, could cut their corporate income tax by 70%. Again, this is this comes down at this point to a uh, policy decision, right? Do you want to have a specialized uh, tax break on a one company in order to get them through the door, which again, the evidence is unclear and actually dubious that that actually happens? Or from a policy standpoint, would you prefer to lower everybody's taxes all across the board? And from my perspective, that seems to be a much more just outcome from attracting a company instead of just targeting its uh, that single company with this better policy. Yeah. Well, and I want to I want to push back on kind of your point, Dan. I, I think that so for using, I feel like it, it's sometimes a shaky comparison if we're talking about um, a tax incentive, so cutting taxes or um, limiting the amount of taxes we take from someone versus when you're talking about drug law enforcement, that's putting resources onto. Of course, resources go into tax cuts, but I'm saying that's putting resources onto a situation rather than removing removing enforcement of something. So if we talk about if let's say there's and you can agree there's a there's a scarce or limited number of police, of time, energy, money that we have mm -hmm. to spend on drug law enforcement. I think the, the equality component comes in where it says we're spending 70% of our resources on 30% of the neighborhood, right? Versus, and so when I think about spreading or saying like we should all be equally enforced or this should be equal across the board, I'm picturing we need to take the same amount of resources and make it equal across the board. You That's mean that we I'm, should raid the rich yes, but raid but raid the other neighborhood, the poor neighborhood less, right? And it's like if it's to <laughs> me, there's an there's an equity in or an equality in spreading the resources evenly, rather than mm -hmm. increasing or decreasing, because it because it does seem to me it seems unjust to say why does one neighborhood get more of those resources it, even if they're it, a negative resource? Would the fact that it was more balanced comfort you if you were the victim of the drug raid? Um, no, <laughs> I mean, no. I'm, not, I'm not presuming any life. No, but I'm saying so. No, no, but I am saying philosophically. For me, I think that it isn't. It isn't. I don't know. To encourage the equality of the spread of a negative resource mm. to me seems doesn't seem as bad as saying continuing with a system that has um, disparate. I guess what am I saying? Um, exercise of those kinds of of those kinds of resources. Does that make sense? So, like, a tax incentive to me is more like we're taking away something. We're taking away. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to say. It. I just feel well, like a tax incentive is you're taxing one group less so that everyone else has to pick up the slack. Because in a typical situation, you're, just because you're taxing this group less doesn't mean the government's spending any less. So it's got to come from elsewhere. Well, right? that was my first question: is where are these? Where is you know, if you're talking about Atlanta, where is this? Where who's paying for this Marta? Um, Amazon Marta bus, mm -hmm. right? Or uh, train. Um, and it's us. I mean, I think the same argument is made for a lot of other things that the government subsidizes. Yeah. But. Okay. So, Dan, no. yeah. I'm just wondering about your point. Is it more about the ability for us all to advocate on our behalfs to get government off of our backs? And if, and if that is kind of your main point, um, I think naturally we all have a different ability to do that. I mean, in the case of Amazon, they mm -hmm. have people they can hire to be lobbyists and to, mm -hmm. to shake hands and make deals, whereas your entrepreneur who's just trying to launch a business doesn't have that kind of time or resources. So where, I guess, is the justice in that, if that we don't all have that same ability to advocate for ourselves? Well, the same mm. justice that the rich person in the in uh, the rich drug, drug user would have in having access to being friends with the local police and mm -hmm. and you know being in, in circles of power even even maybe friends with like the the judge uh and and friends with politicians nearby that like if he uses that access to increase his own liberty i don't see what's wrong with that really what about yeah. that access wow. by them having that access to that person who does have a limited time then that means that somebody else can't advocate for themselves during that time it's not a it's an excludable good essentially these these people's time um that's true that's a good point yeah well so i think there's a danger of taking this drug uh, uh enforcement discussion too far but i would say on that there there might be a demand Say, for example, you do enforce the law equally across, you know, the rich neighborhood and the poor neighborhood and everywhere in between, right? You could imagine that there might at that point be demand for saying, do we need this law at all, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you spread the pain enough, then you end up actually having an incentive to say, well, <laughs> is this a just law to begin with? And I, I suppose I come from a similar perspective when, when I look at the taxes, right? And so if there's so much cash, it is Amazon's cash they're getting to keep. 
That that is true in a lot of ways when it comes to like you know tax breaks, not cash grants. That's a different thing entirely. But when it comes to tax breaks, that is Amazon's cash to begin with, and so that gets to your point of you know whether uh, it's good for a company to be more or less plundered. I would agree it's better for a company to be less plundered by taxes. But anyway, um, I think the point is here: if you end up having a system uh, that favors one, you end up reducing. Uh, the pain generally, and you might actually have less demand for the lowering of taxes generally than with that specialized situation. Well, I, I think there's one issue that addresses both both of the, what uh, you both said that it, uh, uh, the justice of actions of individual actions need to be considered individually. That there are there there might be like indirect ramifications that it might influence the way that other people do other actions. But that can't be factored into when you're considering the justice of the action itself. So, okay. so in in, uh, in the case that you just rose, that like yes, maybe maybe the, it might uh, reduce the demand for uh, uh, to to seek more justice, but we don't know. Like so, like, your so your argument is that we can only say from a moral standpoint or an ethical standpoint that we should not say it's it's it's. Um, morally incor- incorrect to to say yes I'll take that incentive yeah. right so, it's only the the institution has set it up in an, in a flawed way so similarly when you ask where is the money going to come from yeah so mm-hmm. so there's like a series of actions there's like okay I um, am not going to steal plunder this company but I still want these goodies over here so I'm going to plunder from this com- co- company that that's very indirect like mm-hmm. it, it doesn't mm-hmm. change the fact that not that pl- plundering from this other company would have been bad in the first place. So let me ask you this, Dan. Is your position one or both of these? A, that Amazon is okay to have sought these special treatments, mm-hmm. or B, that it's all right for governments to offer these special treatments? Well, both, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I would, yeah. I mean, that's that's how I feel. I feel mm-hmm. that uh, most oftentimes when you when you um, take it back to its beginning, if we look at an issue that we have we have problems with, you unravel that and you see that there is uh, in this situation there's an an institutional incentive to make that decision, right? So it isn't Amazon mm-hmm. who's making the decision that's bad. That's not an unethical decision. Mm-hmm. It's the the institution has encouraged an unethical a decision perceived as unethical, and therefore is the institution unethical, right? Mm-hmm. The tax incentive providing institution. You another I mean? another analogy might be, uh, say, a bully on the playground is stealing kids' lunch money. And so maybe one of the kids is his friend, so he's, he steals less, or maybe not at all, or <laughs> well, maybe actually, just like half. Yeah, I, li- I, like that. I like that metaphor even more, because it's simple, right? That's simple. Yeah. When you talk about just like kids interacting, that's a lot simpler than thinking about the war on drugs. So, but, yeah. but, but, but from a public policy perspective, you don't <laughs> want any kids having right. their lunch money so this stolen. Is here, I think there's True. two points that we're getting close to, but maybe not touching as in the way that I would like. And those two are that the encouragement of other people to get in the game of, I can take these actions, I can rent, seek, essentially get special favors that are outside of just the productivity of my business. And that encourages other people to do it. I'll share a short anecdote. When I was in the sixth grade, we had spelling tests. And very slowly in the class, everybody started to cheat on their spelling tests with this simple strategy of just putting the paper with the words underneath the desk next to them. And it started off with just one kid and he got away with it. And then the next spelling test came around and more kids and more kids and more kids. And the costs versus the benefits were really warped in this situation Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. in the short term I could cheat, get a good grade on the test and be in good social standing with my peers or to do the moral thing and to, and to not cheat. There's the risk of getting a lower score. And um, so I'm just trying to speak to the incentives here that other people wanting to play into it. And then the second thing, which I'll just quickly say is that we are removing some profit and loss signals when Mm we, manipulate incentives this way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do want to, this is, these are, that's an Mm -hmm. awesome anecdote. I do want to go back to the the (laughs) bully stealing the lunch money because I think we're getting a little bit speaking back and forth on the notion of normative and positive, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking, Mm -hmm. I think in some cases, one of us is speaking in the ideal sense and the other one is speaking more in sort of the practical, like what it is sense. The problem is with that lunch money uh, stealing story is that if you believe taxes are theft, 
which I believe is what you're promoting here. Um, <laughs> all right, that's one thing to consider. However, our current system today is rife with taxes. We are going to be taxed one way or the other. Every kid on that playground is going to have his or her lunch money stolen to one degree or another. It is happening. It is not not happening. And so the question is, from a public policy standpoint, do you want the single kid to be able to steal uh, from in particular people, uh, you know, and not steal from his friend, right? Or would you prefer <laughs> every person to be stolen from in an equitable kind of fashion? Because we're not not stealing. That's the bottom line but here. But I think in the reality, we don't have those, like, batched uh the, those clustered choices where you're you're really the choices are just boil down to is this kid going to be stolen or not from or not like it's it's not it oftentimes you think that that there are whole policy directions that you're choosing from but you know, in in the day to day lawmaking, you, it's just you're deciding one thing at a time. So you, you can only look at that one decision. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like it points back to I think Marianne's story with the spelling with the spelling um, tests. I think that we're talking about the lunch money. I think for me, it, it is always how can we create an institution that limits this in every way, right? Yeah. So yes. that means the teacher mm -hmm. wasn't looking, you know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. the incentive needs to be, you're going to fail this test if I catch you cheating, right? It's about how the institution or the even the context creates or incentivizes people to make those decisions. Or and the I culture. Think that that's, that's what mm -hmm. matters. And mm -hmm. is the teacher paying attention to the bully that's stealing? It is what's the context around which these decisions are made. Why is the bully stealing? Why are the class members cheating, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so I agree with you. The context matters. And I also agree with Dan in a sense on, you know, you have to look at these decisions individually. However, policy is not individual. Policy is policy is policy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's the way it works. A policy cannot have exemptions to it in order to be something that actually works across the board. Um, but what, what if in that situation, like say it, it was the question of, okay, the bully decides, oh, I'm only going to steal half of, from you because you, you're my friend. And then a third person comes up and says, wait a minute, steal more because instead of that, you should steal uh, less from everyone across the board. But then it's not more stealing, it's, e it's an equal amount of stealing, right? <laughs> Just theoretically, unequally or unequally. In, in yeah, so, you know, so the I just bully, that's what I'm thinking. The, bu the bully might say, like, oh, okay, you you convince me, I'll steal more from this kid, and then he he never gets around to to following through you know, Dan, on stealing just, less from the other kid. I just think the analogy is flawed because we're not talking about a schoolyard bully. We're talking about a government that you know taxes all of us to one degree or another, and they are empowered to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other factor to to that is that the bully, we don't presume them to have any really further motivations, whereas we assume that if government is issuing a tax or if they're um, giving a subsidy to someone, that there's a reason for it, that we're expecting there to be some greater societal good to come out of it. And Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I, I do think that your point earlier mm -hmm. about having everything being about access mm -hmm. to power is, is a good one. And yeah. everything about the, 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 the game that you're playing is no longer serving the customers, but, but uh, convincing, influencing power. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's why Amazon uh, chose D.C., totally. even though other cities were offering even uh, a sweeter deals. Oh, interesting. So even beyond the incentives and what we talked about, the the metro infrastructure and things like that, you think it's, it's, polit it's getting purely closer? Political. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, an article from uh, on Reason, um, Eric Bohm writes, of course, being close to the seat of political power matters too. Virginia's deal comes with the unwritten promise that Amazon will just be a stone's throw away from not only the country's top lawmakers, but from the most important lobbying firms too. Yeah, I mean, to quote, to quote my favorite, I love Jeff Proctor. He talks a lot about this um, in some of his lectures. And he, he in, I mean, his basic argument is that if somebody's handing out power and, and influence, you as a business are going to take that, You'd right? You're going to use to. your money to get that. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's about, like I said, again, to me, this is institutional or this is about the game or it's about how the game is set up. It's why are we allowing this much power to be given, right? We shouldn't, yeah. we shouldn't, we should limit the amount of power that's, that's available to private entity. Right. You yeah. Know? Frederick Bastiat makes the point that if you make plunder easier than production, then people will choose plunder over production, and no amount, no amount of education or, or morality or mm -hmm, religion mm -hmm. will, uh, will will stop that. 
That's, because the incentives are misaligned. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess I would sort of implore you to change <laughs> your mind, Dan, and, and, and we'll have many conversations on that, this otherwise. But I mean, I regard the Amazon tax breaks as an example of plunder over production. Yeah. Mm. I yeah. believe what they are taking, despite the fact that it would be foolish for them not to take it because it would be a competitive disadvantage because everybody and their mom who has a company mm -hmm. now is getting tax breaks from the government if they're big enough, right? And that's the key is if they're big enough. Mm -hmm. I would say they are falling into the trap and they're influencing us to believe that we can actually get special favors uh, ahead of and above mm -hmm. of what other people have. And, and I find that to be one of the sort of, you quoted Bastiat, one of the unseen consequences of this, these big uh, corporate giveaways that happen. Yeah. And I sound a lot now like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, our <laughs> uh, favorite Democratic Socialist new member of Congress from mm -hmm. uh, New York City, um, because she's been talking about this as a corporate giveaway program as well. Mm -hmm. But we may have different reasons for saying this. <laughs> yes. Uh, and yet we're both somehow yeah, and we're, we're, and we're both somehow, in except for Dan, uh, who's taking a very principled <laughs> stance on it. Uh, which I respect. Yes. Um, but, I, but I think there is some uh, reason that we, we agree on this. And I would implore folks to look at that unseen consequence mm -hmm. of going to the state, the government, and asking them for special favors over others, because that then sets up a situation where that continues going forward. Um, well, unfortunately, we have exhausted our time together. Thank you, each of you. This was a fun conversation. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone on the next VCast. By the way, we are now on several other audio-only platforms, including Apple, uh, the Apple Podcast platform, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, which is awesome. And uh, we just got on iHeartRadio. So, yeah. so please if you can't stand our faces and you just want to hear us, us talk, <laughs> please check us out on anywhere you can get podcasts. All the podcast yeah. places. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you next week on the FeeCast. Thank you.